John chapter 12. When we were studying the book of John, we um, went through this very carefully. And um, since then, we have gone through this portion of scripture uh, a couple times because it's one of my favorite portions uh, that I've been able to teach the last few years. I, I think I've, uh, it's one of my favorite portions because I've always been fascinated with the ability that we have, that's us and them, to be deceived. We have an incredible tendency to be deceived. Everyone in this room, everyone in scripture, and we see it all throughout the Bible. It, it, it's always interested me that, uh, uh, that, that this has happened. And um, we see this overwhelmingly in the triumphal or tearful entry of Jesus Christ that is referred to as Palm Sunday. You can turn those lights back on, please. We, we wanna, I want to see these people. We, have, we need a lot of lighting to see Kenyans. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's true, though. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that one, I think. Uh, deception. For a few reasons, let me tell you a, a couple of them. Number one is we, we, we see this, I've seen it in my own life. I've seen the tendency I have to be completely blinded not be able to read a situation or doctrine clearly and then come to the realization that weeks, months, sometimes even years of deception. When I first got born again, I went into a school or a program that helped people who had uh, addictions like I had and it was a part of a denomination that was incredibly legalistic um, and Legalistic for many reasons. One of the large reasons of their legalism was um, doctrine. They believed bad doctrine. They, they didn't call it bad doctrine. They would have told you it's true. Very legalistic. So as time progressed, I actually just believed what they had taught me. Um, I, I, I started to, to, to really view God in the wrong way. It's probably the reason why I preach the way I do today, uh, the, the leanings I have, even as we study the book of Romans, that um, we have to look to Christ. But in this particular denomination, it was really my efforts that solicited God's uh, continued blessings. Um, for example, if in this denomination, from 19, the 1940s and around there, before that time, if you did not speak in tongues, they didn't even believe you were born again. And then around the, the 40s, um, they changed their doctrine because they saw how much an error it was, some of the new leaders, and then they said, okay, well, you can be born again and not speak in tongues, but if you don't speak in tongues, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Has anybody ever heard that? Of course you have. You're not filled with the Holy Spirit. So as I was in this school and in this denomination and church for 15 months, living in a dorm, <clears throat> not only did we have church every Wednesday and Sunday, we also had chapel service every Monday and Friday. So I was in uh, many services every week, and I was one of maybe like 10 people out of 150 to 200 that did not speak in tongues openly. And uh, it got to the point where, because I believed what they were teaching me, as I didn't know the Bible very well at the time, I thought that there was some spiritual deficiencies in me in that regard. Now, of course, there's spiritual deficiencies, but I thought, well, God loves these people more, or God sees uh, talent or giftings or calling in them more than he does me, and I'm just i um, not going to ever get it. And when I came out of that kind of deception, it was shocking to me because of my pride that I could believe a lie for years. And some of you have experienced this. 
Maybe not in direct reference to tongues, maybe so, but in direct reference to the pastors, the preachers, these, these either bad preachers who may be born again or just plain false teachers, they have convinced you that if you don't have a certain amount of faith, you won't be blessed financially and you won't be blessed with health and these sorts of things, that it all depends upon you to earn the favor of God. And that is one of the great deceptions around the world, but, um, and, and it's alive everywhere, but of course also it's alive here in Africa. And you have felt, well, I just don't have the faith. The pastor is making me pay to pray. It happens in these type of churches a lot. Well, if you, the more money you pay, shows the more faith you have, the more likely your prayers will be answered according to your desires. And many of you, and um, probably different stories, but in some of your stories in coming to Calvary Chapel, have kind of been set free by a good doctrine, as I was uh, when I went to Calvary Chapel. And um, you've kind of guarded your heart against deception, only for me personally to find out that it's as easily for me to be deceived as it is for me to breathe, breathe oxygen. I, I can be deceived right now. And if you have never had these type of revelations, if you don't have a continual kind of lights turning on moments in your life, I would submit to you that it is possible that you are filled constantly with pride these moments where you're like wait I was wrong I was wrong in that situation I have I, I I believe this about this person or I believe this about this doctrine and I was wrong I've been wanting my own will my own desires and I was deceived I deceived myself we learned last week as we were studying Romans 8 when the Apostle Paul said, who is it that condemns you? Well, I've heard a lot, in fact, most ministers in regards to Romans 8, when they preach that, it's like Satan condemns us. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. But I uh, taught you last week that I believe Satan is not the greatest condemner of you. That he is secondary we have three enemies. You remember what we studied last week? Three enemies. And this is an exhaustive list to our souls, to us. You have the world. You have Satan and, and, and the enemies of demons. And the worst enemy of all is us. We are the greatest enemies to ourselves, especially for believers. The flesh deceives us. The flesh condemns us. And so... In like manner, we are greatly deceived by ourselves. We prefer to be true what we prefer, uh, the, the, the preferences of our desires. Our desires deceive us. We build doctrines based on what we want. So that is evidence in my own personal life. I see it all the time. I have to constantly, and, and, and I mean this with all of my heart, say, Lord, please help me to see the situation clearly. I can't see it clearly. I don't know what's going on. I know what I think is right because I'm, I have the tendency to defend myself, to be prideful, and I need to see clearly. I need to know what to say. I can't tell you how often that in a counseling situation here at church, which I do all the time, I did a dozen this week alone, that if I present to the person I'm counseling cookie cutter answers, which I need to know the answers. There, there is a general flow to counsel people who have been hurt in different ways. But there are times when they just won't do. I need the Holy Spirit right in that moment to tell me exactly what to say or it will not penetrate the heart of that person. I found myself in that situation this week in a similar situation I find all the time where there is a person, <clears throat> in many cases women, 
who have been raped and molested. And they are angry to the point where they want these people to die. And, and one person recently was honest enough to say, I'm tired of being a hypocrite. I am mad at God. And I can give that answer, all the answers I want. Well, it's not God's fault and God told us not to eat and these classic things. But unless the Holy Spirit speaks through me to that exact situation, the exact words that woman needs to hear, it's all true. Truth is what changes. It'll be fruitless. So I see this in my own personal life. That's number one, the tendency to be deceived. Number two, I see it all through scripture. And that'll be in the scripture we're in today. We see it all through scripture, how deceived we really are. And and we see it in the Old Testament, especially with the nation of Israel. Now, we read these stories, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we read these stories like the parting of the Red Sea. And we think, man, if I saw a billion gallons of water fly up in the air and a a dry land where I can walk through, do you actually think we'll be complaining the next day or a few days later against God? In our own mind, we would say, I would never do that if I saw such a miracle. But the reality is, that's deception. You very well could do that. And we know that that's true for us. Number one, because all humanity has sin in common. Deception. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, the Bible says. But God is faithful and able for us to be able to provide a way of escape that we may be able to bear up under it. We, we, we have seen on Sunday morning, we have seen people come in, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, daughters, and sons, come in in this very room and after years of rebellion and pride and a refusal to submit to Jesus Christ, we've seen them in this very room submit to Jesus Christ. We've seen those miracles, haven't we, church? And then the very next day, we start complaining. And all complaints are against God, so we complain against God. We do the same thing the nation of Israel has done. You look at it in the disciples, and we're going to see that today, but look at it in the disciples when Jesus Christ would try to get them, uh, for lack of better words, to be cut down to size, if that translates, to, to, to get the disciples to see exactly who they are, weak, without strength, lacking the ability to know what's true without Jesus Christ. And in seeing that, Jesus trying to get, communicate that to them, what did the disciples always do except for very rare occasions? They would defend themselves. I will never leave you, Jesus. Remember, Peter said that, didn't he? All the disciples like, Jesus Christ said, you're all going to betray me. And they're all like, we will never betray you. And then Peter would even say, even if all of these losers, even if all of these men betray you, I will not. He's beating his chest. I will not do it. I'm a strong man. And it wasn't until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is after the spiritual resurrection of these disciples, that they were able to truly see who they really are. This week we're in Passion Week where the world is celebrating Palm Sunday and we are going to see from this portion that that deception continues in these disciples and I pray you can see it how is it continued in our lives. It says here in John 12 verse 12, the next day a great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. 
His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done these signs. Or this sign, the Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. The whole world has gone after him. And now there were certain Greeks amongst those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it. For eternal life, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servants will be also. If anyone serves me, he, my father, will honor. Now, this is an incredible portion of scripture. This is what the world is talking about all around the world today. This is Palm Sunday. And, and, and it is no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that at the end of This occasion, this event, this event that the world is celebrating that Jesus talks about, that the only way to life for us is to walk through the corridor of self-denial, which the Bible talks about is personal death. It's the only way. It's no coincidence that the Bible, that Jesus Christ is mentioning how deceived we are in believing what life is and what death is. We're going to get into that. At every stage in the scripture that I just read to you, everyone in the story is deceived. Everyone. It's remarkable deception. Um, I I have a whole teaching here, like I said earlier, I don't want to go through all of it, I just want to review the points so that you can see that at every stage everyone is deceived, and then I want to focus at the end what is happening here, and and I want to exhort us today, I want to exhort us to change, actually more than change, transformation. You have the presentation of Jesus Christ, you have the proclamation of the multitudes, You have the prophecy of the Old Testament, and you have the preaching, or excuse me, the perplexity of the disciples and the preaching of Jesus Christ, okay? Everyone is deceived. Jesus is trying to get people to see this. First, you have the presentation of Jesus Christ. For the first time in all of Jesus Christ's ministry, he is presenting himself to the public as the savior of the world, the one who will die on the cross, uh, and other times it was, it was hidden. It was talked about. And Jesus Christ would even say things like um, to the leper, don't tell people about this healing. And to other healings, don't tell the people I've healed you. Don't tell them who I am. It's interesting that he would do that. In John chapter 2, this very book, Jesus' mother, Mary, came to him at the wedding of Cana in Galilee and said to him, excuse me, said to the crowds, whatever he says, do it, because they had run out of wine. And then Jesus Christ says to his mother, woman, what do I have to do with you? Guys, ladies, don't try that with your moms at home. It's a different culture. But Jesus says, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. In John chapter 7, his very rude, hateful, bitter, jealous half-brothers came to him. And they say, hey, why don't you present yourself in Jerusalem? That's where all the big shot rabbis go. And you're some big shot. You're supposed to be this greatest rabbi of all time. 
I paraphrase that, by the way. Jesus Christ says, hey, what do I have to do with you? The world doesn't hate you, it hates me because I testify that their deeds are evil. My hour has not yet come. Jesus Christ is teaching us that the way he presents himself, that the foundation of our relationship with him begins at the cross and not with supernatural healings and not with supernatural feedings. And any ministry that bases their entire foundation on healings Watch out, it's dangerous. Jesus Christ says, my hour has come in the portion of scripture we just read. He is presenting himself to a people who are desiring him to be their king for what he can do for them, not the king who is worthy of worship from them. John chapter 6, he fed these 5,000 men, which is thousands of more people because of men, women, and children. They want to make him king. And they say, we were going to make him king by force. There's an irony for you. You will rule us or else. He goes up on the mountain. They go to follow him after he feeds all those people. Guys, if any politician today... If any politician fed 12 to 15,000 of us with no groceries, he did it supernaturally, Kenya would vote for him. And we vote for people on much less, don't we? Go to a rally, they collect 1,050 bobs or 100 bobs or 200 bobs and they hand them out and they're like, you got our vote. Isn't it amazing on something so small and unworthy, we will vote for somebody? That's what's going on with Jesus Christ. John chapter 6. They came out after they realized he's not on the mountain. He actually walked on water uh, because the disciples had already taken the boat on the other side. And, uh, well, and, and Jesus was walking on water, and that's when Peter walked on water. And now they're on the other side. Well, the multitudes cross Galilee, and they're like, hey. How did you get here? Jesus doesn't even answer the question because Jesus always addresses the heart before he addresses the mouth. And he says, you didn't come except for the loaves and the fishes. This is why you came. You came because you want me for something that you should not want me for. Because the only relationship Jesus Christ is going to have with us foundationally is through the cross and the burial and the resurrection. That's how he presents himself and they are deceived. You look at the proclamation of the multitudes, secondly. You look at it. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. You know in Luke chapter 19 when they're doing this, do you know what Jesus starts to do? You remember? He begins to weep. He's weeping. He says, oh, Israel, I would have gathered you. Zahin gathers her chicks, but you would not let me. You, you don't want me for who I am. You want me for what I can do for you. And what I can do for you is much greater than physical food or lower taxes. What I can do for you will save your souls. And he begins to weep. Hosanna means deliver us. Oh, deliver us from Rome. Deliver us from poverty. Deliver us from disease. Deliver us, Lord. We, we're suffering. And the Lord does care about those things. I'm not saying he doesn't. But that is not the, the, the thing that we need the most. They're deceived. You look at the prophecy of the Old Testament. It, it, it talks about Jesus. When he had found a young donkey, he sat on it because in Zechariah 9, 9, the Bible says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. We studied in detail Luke chapter 19 when Jesus Christ says, Hey, I told you the day I was coming. 
you don't know the day of your visitation, you will be cursed. Jerusalem will be destroyed. Your children will die and suffer. Why? Because in Daniel chapter 9, he told us when he was coming. And guys, think about it. It's simple addition. It's 173,880 days after Nehemiah chapter 2, Artaxerxes gives the command. And even if you jumble up the calendars, you can at least guess the year that Jesus Christ is going to be there if you disagree with, with uh, the, the uh, teaching I give, gave a few weeks ago. You can guess the year at least. Nobody's doing it. They're completely deceived. It, it says, and then you look at the perplexity of the disciples. It says, they did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus is glorified, then they remember all the things that were spoken about him in the Old Testament. It's not talking about the New Testament, the Old Testament. All the things that were spoken about him. It, so, listen, they don't understand anything that's going on. And it's not because what's going on is ununderstandable. It's because they're deceived by their own personal desires, and when they're deceived by their own personal desires, when we are deceived by our own personal desires, that is not the will of God, we can't even know what two plus two is spiritually. We can't even know it. I mean, think about it. Is it hard to add up 173,880 days? Is that a difficult mathematical problem? This ain't fractions, people. This is an algebra. We don't got to go back to pre-calculus, thank God, right? This is it's, it's, it's basically going to be about 483 years. Put it on the calendar. We may get it off by a month or two or a year, but Jesus Christ is coming, or the Christ, the Messiah. And they can't even understand that. They don't know what it's talking about. And it is not, like I said, because it's ununderstandable. It's because they are deceived by their own personal desires. And only after God, only after Jesus Christ is glorified, now they can see clearly. Now, because Jesus Christ is on the throne of their minds and hearts, and he has completely taken over their will through a corridor of death, now they see the world clearly. That's what's going on. And that's why this preaching of Jesus Christ here at the end is so vital to us today. Because we're deceived at times. Maybe some more than others, that's fine. These Greeks, they come. They find the only disciple that Jesus Christ has that has a Greek name, that is Philip. They said, please let us see Jesus. It is presumed that these Greeks may have converted because to Judaism, they're there during Passion Week, they're there during Passover Week, where the Jews are worshiping Yahweh. We want to see Jesus. We've heard about his displays of power. Um, it's possible that these Greeks may even at a distance have seen the healings, have seen the um, feedings or whatever displays of power Jesus Christ has over the supernatural material world and they want to speak to him and is it a coincidence that Jesus Christ after all the deception we just talked about the deception that is from beginning to end that he now begins with you cannot be with me and you cannot see clearly unless you die first he is addressing exactly what these Greeks need to hear in their hearts. The same way when that rich young ruler, do you remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, in answering the question, what must I do to follow you? Jesus Christ said to the rich young ruler, you want to follow me? I'll tell you what you do. I want you to go sell all of your goods I want you to give them to the poor and I want you to come follow me. And what happened to this rich young ruler? He went away sorrowful because he had much possessions. 
That's what the Bible says. Now, is this some sort of biblical teaching that every rich person has to sell all of their goods and start walking around the world following Jesus Christ? No. Jesus Christ was addressing exactly what was in that man's heart. What was in him. His God was money and power. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, is doing the same thing right here. All of these people, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, worshiping him. His disciples, not just the crowds during Palm Sunday or Monday, not just the people who didn't know Jesus Christ personally, everybody from the closest friends of Jesus Christ, James, John, and Peter, all the way to the person in the back of the crowds on this very day that was worshiping him, was worshiping him for the wrong reasons. They were worshiping him because they were voting for him as the new politician, the new king, because he could give them what they wanted and they wanted out of poverty. They want it out of governmental oppression. And Jesus Christ says, okay, my hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus Christ is saying, this is my greatest hour this is the hour in which I am revealing myself and the foundation of this ministry is the cross of Jesus Christ that's what he's saying I will go die and if I don't go die there will not be fruit if I die there will be much fruit and we know that if you drop seed in the ground and the outer shell remains alive and doesn't die and break open, then the stalk will not come up and bear fruit. So Jesus Christ is getting us to see the real reasons why we worship him. Doesn't matter if we have food or we don't, we worship him. It doesn't matter if we have school for or we don't, we worship him. And then he goes on and he addresses the multitudes, he addresses these Greeks, he addresses the disciples, and ladies and gentlemen, he is addressing us this morning, unless we die, we will not bear fruit. He would say, he who loves his life will lose it, but he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If we are not so consumed with the kingdom of God, If the main motivation and purpose for our existence, every believer in this room, is not for the kingdom of God, the real kingdom of God, then we will lose our lives for eternity. That's what the Bible's saying. That the real identification of a real believer is somebody who has walked through the painful corridor of their own death, death to their plans, death to their dreams, death to their soul so that they can be born again into a new creation created in Christ Jesus. So the question that I ask you guys, have you died? We have our plans We have our dreams. We have all the things we want to do. And if we're honest, most of us are asking Jesus to join our ride, our journeys, and our plans so that he can help us along the way. Rather than us saying, I'm getting off of this bus, the bus of my own personal desires. I'm getting off of the bus of my own personal dreams and plans and I am following the will of God. That's why in Matthew 7, Jesus Christ would say, only those who do the will of the Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's different in the West than it is here where I grew up. We make our own plans apart from Jesus Christ. 
In your guys' case, your entire family makes plans for you, and in some cases, apart from Jesus Christ, will. And, and ladies and gentlemen, that is just the simple reality of the idolatry that we find here in Kenya and throughout the world. We have made our own plans without God. And if we have not been interrupted, if we've not been interrupted both in the macro, that is in the big plans of our life, and if we are not constantly interrupted in the micro, that is the everyday plans of our life, and, uh, then we think we're the boss of our lives. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's king. He's boss. He has every right to lead us into a uh, situation where we find ourselves in prison like the Apostle Paul. And if you were to look at the Apostle Paul's life, guys, even his friends who were Christians were like, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. The Holy Spirit told us last night. And you know what Paul tells them? He's like, good, that's confirmation because the Holy Spirit told me that if I go there, I will die too. But guess what? I don't care if I die because I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. This isn't confirmation I shouldn't go. This is just confirmation that I'm going to die. <laughs> and you could be a friend of the Apostle Paul and actually say, Paul, it seems like you hate your life in this world. And Paul says, yes, it does look that way because I love my life with Jesus Christ. And he has led me into these situations. We don't have all of us the same calling and the same journey. So I don't really want to get specific. I, I don't know. I, I just don't know if the Lord, has, uh, I don't know what he's called you to, but I know that the Lord has not all called us to the same things. He who will lose his life for my sake will gain it for eternal life. Then he says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Isn't that such, it, it almost is offensive how simple that is. Jesus Christ says, if I walk over here in the corner of this stage, and you don't walk with me, you won't be with me. If I walk over here to the corner of this stage, and you walk with me, you will be with me. Isn't that interesting? It's like, um, okay. Got it, makes sense. And then we have to stop and say, no, it doesn't, it doesn't actually quite make sense because I get the feeling that I have been telling Jesus Christ to follow me my whole life rather than following him. And we have to stop, ladies and gentlemen, and say, is Jesus Christ Lord, Savior, King, God made flesh? Or did I just want him to... to to be an addition to my life as a personal accessory of fashion and glory for myself because that's how most Christians view him today. And we need to be confronted by this. And we need to say, wow, I have been deceived and the worst enemy of my soul is my own flesh. Why won't God give me school fees for university? I must not be in favor with God. No, maybe he doesn't want you to go. Does he have a right? Oh, you guys just got uncomfortable right there. The idolatry of formal education. I just saw some people like, oh, I don't like that. I don't know. Maybe he does want you to go. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he wants you to go to China. Does God have a right to send you to China? Does God have a right to send you to Iraq? I was going to go into business. I was going to go into business. I was sitting on a rock with the sun setting in the state of Maine. Beautiful, spring, or excuse me, fall day. And I asked the question, Lord, before I go into business, I need to know what you want for my life. I, I, I don't know what to do. Where do you want me to go? You lead, 
I follow. And most of us are saying, I lead in Christ, you follow. And right there on that rock, because guess what? He's faithful, church. When we ask, we will receive. When we seek, uh, we will find. And when we knock, the door will be open. And that day on that rock in the state of Maine on a fall uh, uh, sunset, he said, I do not want you to go in the business. I want you to go to Kenya. (laughs) And he told me, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. As I was reading 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you've not had the moment in your life where you acknowledge who Jesus Christ is, the savior of the world and have the foundation of your relationship to be the cross of Jesus Christ where you have genuinely say, Lord, no longer am I leading and you follow. Tell me what to do. If you've not done this, you need to. You need to. Nothing wrong with going into business. Nothing wrong with having some formal education. But they become wickedness if that's not what God has led you to do. And what a beautiful promise, if anyone serves me, I will be with them. And where I am, you will follow, and there my servants will be. Guys, don't you want to be where Jesus Christ is? He will not follow you. I promise you, Jesus Christ is offended at the notion of following us. It'd be like the, uh, uh, a blind person leading the, 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 the savior of the world. He won't do it. But when we die to ourselves and start following Jesus Christ, we are made alive into a mission, into a calling that is so incredible. That's where your joy is. That's where your peace is. That's where the glory of God is. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. One commentator, F.B. Meyer, said, the application of these representatives of Western civilization reminded our Lord of his glorious enthronement as Savior and the Lord of mankind. But he realized that the dreams of the prophets could be fulfilled and the demand of the world met only through his death and resurrection. There was no other way to the glory than Calvary and the grave. If his love for men was to bear fruit, as it says here, he must fall into the ground and die. Death is the only way to saviorship. Death is the only cure of loneliness and the necessary price of fruitfulness. He goes on to say, and through life, we must be prepared to erect altars on which to sacrifice all that hinders our highest service to our fellows. The soul that dares to live in this way finds streams flowing from every smitten rock in the desert and honey in the carcass of every slain lion. Day out of night, spring out of winter, flowers out of frost, Joy out of sorrow, fruitfulness out of pruning, Olivet out of Gethsemane, life out of death, but through it all our aim must be that the Father and the Son will be glorified. I hope that wasn't too heady. Here's the simple, here's the simple thing, guys. Christianity is us coming to an end of ourselves. And until we come to the end of ourselves, and stop treating Jesus Christ as a fiance and making him our husband and Lord, we will not come into a fruitful life. Does this make sense? Confront yourself. Number one, confront yourself because number two, you have acknowledged, I've acknowledged the tendency we have to be deceived. And then when we do that and we genuinely ask God the question, 
here am I, Lord, send me. What would you have me do? Then we find ourselves doing the things that God has called us to do. And there, and only there, after we've passed through that death, that we find life, and we find glory, and we find joy, and we find peace. And that is the answer for every one of us. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer as the worship team comes up. Lord, we we thank you for this word as the world is celebrating you coming into Jerusalem. We see how deceived all of these people were. And Lord, I've seen how deceived I have been. And we, I hope, as a group, have seen how deceived all of us can be at times in our lives. Help us to see clearly. And we know that one of the ways that we see clearly is by dying to ourselves and coming alive into your will. I pray for that, Lord. I pray for that for every single one of us. And also, Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would convey this message that your word is conveying and go well beyond my limitations to communicate it. Please bear fruit in this message. Please, Lord, help. Holy Spirit, please do your work of going into our minds and hearts right now to see how deceived we've all been. Maybe it's not a deception of even what Christianity it is, and we have come to this realization before, but it is a deception about our calling, about a situation that we're in, a relationship that we're in. Help us to see clearly, please. Help us to be purged of our own desires and your will to be made alive in every one of our lives. Lord, we worship you in our offering, thanking you for the privilege we have to give. Also, against the flesh, we give. Our flesh doesn't want to give this money. But this is what the church has done for 2,000 years. This is why we're doing it in our service And Lord, we believe that through walking in the Spirit, by this offering, we can make a statement that we believe in the kingdom of God over the kingdom of this world, including our own personal lives and kingdoms. Receive our offering as an act of love, faith, and obedience. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.